bow our heads for prayer as we start this morning. Father, we just thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given to us. And Father, again, we just want to thank you for your great love. And as we open your word this morning again, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be the teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are in Romans 8, and we're starting with verse 17 of Romans 8. And we started looking at that last week, and it says, And since indeed children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. So indeed, since, so indeed it is a fact that we suffer with him so, so that we may also be glorified with him. And remember I said last week, there is no conditions in that verse at all. This is stating a fact. In other words, it is a fact that we suffer with Jesus Christ because we are in him, is what Paul is saying there in that verse. So last week what we looked at was uh, basically the difference between the seal and the uh, inheritance, or, or, yeah, the inheritance. And, and the Bible puts it this way, the Holy Spirit is both. He is both. In other words, he is the seal that we are sons of God, and when are we sealed? We're sealed the moment we believe. That's when we are sealed as sons of God at that moment. And he is also the down payment, our inheritance. In other words, he's the down payment on our inheritance in, on that. So he is both this uh, to us. Although it is still future, our inheritance is certain. And since the Holy Spirit is, is himself its first fruits, guaranteeing that the harvest will follow in due course. Thus, the same indwelling spirit who assures us that we are all God's children also assures us that we are his heirs. So we are both in this. We have that assurance. The word suffer typically implies something negative. But in this statement, it's all positive. Yes, but what Paul, Paul is a realist, folks. He is a total realist, and he doesn't try to bury this or put his head in the sand or anything when it comes to suffering. Suffering is part of our existence on this planet. There is no way of getting around it, and Paul doesn't go into a lot of explanation about it. But what he's trying to do in this passage is what? Comfort believers. Yes, it is a consequence. It is a result. Right. And so it's, it's another affirmation this, that you have been adopted. Yes, it's an affirmation that you are a proof that you are a son of God. In, in view of the fact that you suffer yeah. with him is a proof or a consequence. Not only that, we suffer because we, we love the Lord, he suffers with us. Yes, and we'll look at that. And the thing to remember is now that, that when Paul is talking about suffering here, and we're not getting into suffering this morning because we still got the airship to deal with, but when he's talking about suffering here, he is talking about uh, <clears throat> all suffering, but specifically a certain type of suffering. And that's the suffering as a result of being a believer in Jesus Christ. See, unbelievers do not suffer that kind of suffering. Only believers do. So that's, there's a distinction between this one type of, of suffering. Because an unbeliever does not suffer because he is a, a Christian. No, it shouldn't be. Yes. Right. But, but that, this is the specific type of suffering that Paul is zeroing in on, is the persecution for being uh, a child of, of God, you know, and, th and that is a natural result of that. We have to remember, folks, that we 
are now aliens. We are now foreigners on this planet. We don't belong here anymore. We have changed sides. So now we have an enemy. And that enemy hates who? He hates Jesus Christ. And, so, and thus, because he hates Jesus Christ, he hates you and I. Yes, we are enemies. We are enemies. We're absolute enemies to Satan and to this world. We are enemies. And that's another thing we need to realize as being in Christ, that is a natural result and consequence of being in Christ, is that, that it's going to happen. Jesus made that very clear, that you're going to suffer tribulation because you are in me, is what he is saying there. We will suffer tribulation. Okay, so we are moving on in verse 17. We're going to be looking at heirs and, heirs and inheritance on this, and we're going to probably spend a study or two on this. So one of the things we have to see as we look at this, all authorities are agreed in saying that the apostle probably had in his mind here a main characteristic of Roman law with respect to these matters with inheritance. In other words, he was writing to Romans, the church at Rome, and he takes it for granted that they are familiar with their own laws. According to Roman law, all children of a man were his inheritors and they equally inherited. That was the point that Paul is trying to get across in this statement. That everybody inherits. In other words, in Jesus Christ we all inherit equally is what Paul is trying to get across. Now in Jewish law the firstborn received what? A double portion. So it wasn't an equal inheritance involved here. He received a double portion. What in Roman law is saying that all the inheritors inherited equally, and that's the point that Paul's trying to get across, is that if we're in Jesus Christ, our inheritance is certain, and we're all going to inherit, period. Yes. 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 And we'll and we'll get to that. We're moving a little bit too fast here, <laughs> but we'll get to that. On that, did you have a thought? No, I'm just trying to hear. Okay. So, uh, so all are children of God. That's the point that he wants to make at this point. Now, it doesn't mean that we're all going to receive equal rewards. No, Scripture makes that very plain, that we don't all receive equal rewards. We are all equal inheritors. No, we're not. And that's the thing. And I think our reward, basically, if you really want my opinion on it, is people. That is our reward. I really believe that's what our reward is. So some are going to have more than others, you know, in, in their uh, work and stuff on this uh, world, on that. Uh, so one star differs from another star in glory, but we are all inheritors of the same glory. We all receive the same glory, is what Paul is trying to get across here. And then in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, it says, therefore, being, or, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So what Paul is saying here is that um, that is one of the consequences of justification by faith is that one day we will see God as he is. 
one day we will see Jesus Christ as he is, and one day we're going to see ourselves in, new, in a new humanity. And that's what Paul is saying, and it's guaranteed, is what he's saying there. Is that's the hope of the glory that he's talking about here, that we will one day have that. And it's the inevitable consequence of justification by faith. And so he's giving us the certainty of this, the hope that we have this. And then he says uh, that we are children and that we are now children of God. That's what he's saying here. It's not a condition. You know, in a lot of your Bibles it says if. Well, in the Greek, it's not a condition. It is a fact. The fact is that you are a child of God. You are a son of God. And if you are a child of God and you're a son of God, then you are an heir. That's automatic, uh, what Paul is bringing out in this passage. And so, uh, in John chapter 1, verse 11, it says, He, the Lord Jesus, came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, by the way, that word power there is not dynamite. It's a different word uh, that's used here. It means that if we believe, we have the power, we have the right, we have the authority to become a son of God, is what uh, John is saying there. And then uh, in James... Uh, 118, it says, of his own will he begat us or birthed us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That we should be kind of first fruits of his creatures. And how did he birth us? Is by the word, is how this took place. And then the Apostle Peter, in his second epistle, 1 verse 4, whereby are given to us as exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. Now that's awesome when you stop to think about this, that we are now partakers of the divine nature. And how are we partakers of the divine nature? How are we partakers of the divine nature? The Holy Spirit indwelling you. The Holy Spirit sealing you to God. That is how we are partakers of the divine nature. Yes. Which verse? Oh, that is in Second Epistle of Peter, chapter one, verse four. So he came because it was God in Christ who formed Adam, who breathed in his nostrils, and he was a son of God. A new creation, a new type of being was found in Adam and Eve, and we are of that family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what our, our purpose was to exist. So we messed up. But God did not mess up. And that word who created the world is the word that we keep here. And through his spirit, it changes us. Yes. Yes. 
Yes, this will all be made new, according to Scripture. <clears throat> so this world is not going through. Just remember that. There's going to be a new world <laughs> on that. So the thing we need to realize is that the Spirit working through this Word is power. And it transforms. Yes. No, it's not us. Not at all. It's the word, the spirit. In fact, this book is a dead book without the spirit. Absolutely. Without the Holy Spirit, this book is dead. But it's the Holy Spirit that gives the word life. You know. mm-hmm. Right. Yes. And another text to look at is John 1.13. Who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but are God. And that is the new birth, that is regeneration. And that is the birth that Jesus talked to Nicodemus about when he said, you must be born again from above. You know, so that's a birth that cannot ever be produced by us, folks. We couldn't birth our own selves in natural birth. We certainly couldn't birth ourselves spiritually without God doing that. See, God is the one that has to do that and accomplish that. So this doesn't come from man. So we're born above, from above, born of the Spirit. And this, is, and this does not mean that we are gods. That is not what this means at all. It just means that we are partakers of the divine nature, and this is a mystery. We cannot fully explain this. But it is the Holy Spirit who is living in us. That is the divine nature that we have. Remember, when you are born naturally, you have one nature. And that one nature is your sinful, fallen human nature. When you are born again, when you are regenerated, you have two natures. You still have your sinful, fallen human nature, but now you have a divine nature living in you. And they are at war. That's why you struggle. <laughs> because those two natures are at war, and, my, and folks, they're going to be that way until the day you die. They will struggle. Always. Because your old human nature doesn't give in, ever. It's subdued, it's controlled by your divine nature. But it never uh, changes. In other words, you never can change your human nature. Too many Christians are trying to change themselves. You can't do that. What did, what did Christ do with your nature? He took it to the cross and he did it in. See, he, God and your nature doesn't compromise. They don't work together. That which is born of flesh remains flesh. That which is born of spirit remains spirit. That is what John tells us. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes, that, that's the whole thing. That's why as long as there's life, there's hope. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's why you can't ever give up on someone. (laughs) 
Is that what the psalmist said? <coughs> oh, Solomon, okay. So this teaching that we're looking at of, of error, being an error, is a central theme in the Bible. It is a central theme, and this truth influences our whole view of Christian life. It is as important as that. It involves our whole view of this world and the life in this world. So what the Apostle Paul is trying to do here is he is giving comfort to these people. The Christians in Rome were suffering. And so he gives an explanation of their suffering. He is writing to comfort them. And the chief comfort he has to give them is that they are heirs of God. That is the controlling thought that he is using here. Now what we want to look at this morning is a little bit of difference between true and false evangelism. I hope I keep this in balance and not get too over-enthusiastic one way or the other on this. But there is a tendency for a long time now uh, within the Christian community to very much lighten the gospel and to make it more seeker uh, adaptable and one of the ways they do that is let's just get rid of wrath completely out of the picture that's one of the and that's a bad move an absolute bad move and so one of the things that have developed is a health and prosperity gospel and I'm not saying that this is all bad. That's not what I'm saying here. But there's a problem with this health and prosperity gospel that many uh, people have succumbed to. Uh, uh, one of the examples was Jim and Tammy Baker. Uh, they preached this kind of evangelism. And they taught that God would make believers rich and prosperous. Tammy said, when I tell God what, I, what car I want, I even tell him what color I want. See? And you heard what the pastor mentioned about Creflo Dollar, about this airplane he wanted, this jet, super jet, all that type of thing. Um, this is not scriptural, folks. That's the thing we need to understand about this kind of, of, of teaching. Uh, far too often, evangelism takes the form of saying, Are you in trouble? Are you unhappy? Are you failing somewhere? To do, do you need some help? Very well, come to Christ and you will get all you need. Thank God it is very true that if you come to Christ, you will derive many benefits. But I do not find the Christian gospel presented in that way in the New Testament itself. Another form of evangelism urns, urges us to become Christians in order to solve the problems of the world in order to make the world a wonderful place to live in. Similarly, I do not find that teaching in the Bible. In other words, we can reform the world through politics. See, it doesn't work, folks. We must be careful never to present the gospel in a way that puts it into lines with the cults. That is the, what cults do. They say, are you worried? Well, believe this theory and you will lose your worry. Are you suffering ill health? Just realize that there is no such thing as matter, no such thing as disease, no such thing as pain. If you but believe that, you will lose all your aches and pains and you will be perfectly well. Does that work, Alan? <laughs> that is typical of the cults. They come to us and offer to put everything right for us here and now. That is the problem with this kind of teaching. And this is not what you're going to see in the New Testament. Suffering is a main theme of the New Testament. The main theme throughout the New Testament. Uh, and we don't find this anywhere in the Bible. The Bible, unlike the cults, does not seem at first to promise us very much in this life. What it does promise lies mainly where? In the future. 
in the future, not this life, not this world. Well, it does give us the promise of a relationship now. Yes, and I'll get into that. But, right, right. But the whole Bible promises that glorious future. And this teaching should govern our evangelism. The chief reason why men should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is that they are under the wrath of God and that they die under the wrath of God. They will go to hell and their eternal future will be one of misery and shame. So this is the whole point of the New Testament. They must escape from the wrath to come. That is the message of John the Baptist and that was the message of our Lord himself. They did not come to people and say the gospel will solve your problem for you and enable you to live a happy life while you are in this world. They called for repentance because in their state of sin, men and women are under the wrath of God. The main thrust of the New Testament evangelism is always in terms of this wrath to come. That is very clear. And the two great possibilities that face us for all eternity, such is the theme that we are dealing with here. Now, what God does promise you in all this is that it does not deny that there are very important promises for this life, promises that God will be with us in trouble, provide an inner peace in turmoil, minister comfort when we are distressed, and never leave us. But the basic idea is not that we shall escape trouble here, but rather be given grace to go through it. And the blessings of our inheritance are almost entirely reserved for us in heaven. Now, we do have part of the inheritance right now. Every one of us in this room this morning has part of the inheritance. If you are being indwelt by the Holy Spirit you have a down payment of the inheritance right now while you're here on this earth. That much you have is the down payment. The Holy Spirit himself is the down payment of the inheritance. And who are, we're going to be looking at what we do inherit in a little bit here. But there are some things that are more important than others when we look at this. So... Another thing about this teaching of uh, this prosperity type of teaching, popular evangelism too often comes to us and says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and all will be well with you. You will never have any troubles or problems. The whole world will be changed. You will walk down the road of life with a light step and all your problems will have gone. People believe this. And on they go for months and perhaps a year or two. Then things begin to go wrong with them and they pray to God. They say, I only have to ask God and, he will, and all will be well. But nothing happens. Things are not put right and they are surrounded by trials and troubles and the malice of other people. The devil seems to be active. Old temptations rise up and shake them and they wonder where they are and what is happening to them. Then the devil comes and says, you have never been a Christian at all. (coughs) Because if you were a Christian, obviously these things would not be happening to you. Or, don't you remember what the evangelist said? And so they think they have never been Christians at all. Or the devil will come to them and say, didn't I tell you not to believe this garbage? Now look what's happening to you. See? This, and these are what, then this is where people really get messed up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes.
Right. Very opposite. Yes. Yes. And and God will give you joy and peace. You will have that in this life. He will give you that. Remember, happiness is based on your circumstances. Joy and peace is what you have in Jesus Christ. It's a gift. On that, there's a big difference between the two. If I was driving a Rolls Royce in here this morning, I'd be very happy. But ten days from now, I may not be happy. See, it's the circumstances that would be uh, making me happy. See, but joy and peace is something that will stay with you and does not leave you. And it doesn't leave you when you're in trials. If you want to see what Paul says about that, read the book of Philippians, the letter to the Philippians. He is talking about that we should have a life of joy and a life of peace in the midst of trials and suffering. That should always be there in our life as a Christian. The, the joy and the peace should be there. True evangelism does not offer some panacea for all the ills in our life in this world. It does not promise to make us perfect in a moment or to set the whole world right. So these are not the things that the gospel promise. Uh, us. The, the gospel, most of what the gospel is promising us is in the future, folks. That's the thing we need to realize. And we need to be looking forward to the future. There's not enough preaching today on this subject. There's just not enough preaching today on this subject of the heir, the heirship, the inheritance that we have to look forward to and to the second coming. If you believe what the apostle says here, you will be in no difficulty when someone tells you that the gospel is not true because you are experiencing trials. You say, were we ever promised by the gospel that we should have no problems? If, since or in view of the fact we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. The suffering of this present time are real, and I cannot promise you that they are going to decrease. But I can tell you that you is that they are not worthy to be compared with the glory which is coming. Hold on, therefore. Quit yourself as a man. Carry on, because whatever may happen to you in this life, that inheritance is absolutely certain. That is how the gospel speaks to us. So I emphasize that this is a vital doctrine from the standpoint of evangelism as well as from the standpoint of pastoral ministry. Now, what we're going to look at next is what we are going to inherit, and then we're going to look at some of the promises in the Bible in regards to the inheritance that we have. Yes. Up. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, yes. Mm. 
Yes. Right. It's like I told you last week, if you guys want to read some books that are, they're hard reading, but read The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, both of those books. They're hard reading, but uh, it's like with Bilbo Baggins uh, in the book Hobbit, you know, Gandalf docks on his door and tells Bilbo he needs to go on an adventure. In other words, this is kind of the same as sanctification, that Bilbo needed an adventure because he was just too comfortable in his little hobbit hole there. And then he told Bilbo that he was going to send these dwarfs there, and there was a mission that he was going to go on. And when the dwarfs came, before you can go on this adventure, you're going to have to sign this contract. And when Bilbo started reading the fine print on this contract, well, are not going to be guaranteed my six squares a day? No, we can't guarantee you that. Are, am I going to be guaranteed a comfortable bed every night? No, we can't guarantee you that. Well, is Smog going to toast me in the end? Well, we can't guarantee that he won't. In other words, God isn't guaranteeing you any of these things, folks. That's not what he's guaranteeing you in this life I'm talking about. In this journey that we're on, we're not guaranteed any of those things. See, we may not even have a squ one square a day to eat. You know, that's a possibility in that. In fact, in Hebrews 11, it talks about that, his, that some of his people were what? Destitute. What does that mean? They were homeless. They had nothing. Exactly. So this is, this is what the scripture brings up. So now we're going to look at the, uh, the inheritance. First we're going to look at some of the lesser items that we're going to receive. These are the lesser items. <laughs> the small things. <laughs> First of all, we're going to have a heavenly home. We're promised a heavenly home. Jesus told us in John 14 that I have prepared a place for you. You're going to have a mansion or a room, whatever you want to call it there. That is a promise that we have been given there. We're going to have a heavenly banquet. When we first get there, we're all going to be together and at this great feast. And that means not just Seventh-day Adventists looking at each other. <laughs> it's going to be Christians from everywhere that we'll be sitting across from. There are brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's what this heavenly banquet will have that. Another thing is that we will rule with Christ. We will reign with Christ. And the Bible brings that out very clearly in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and Luke 19.11-27, and also in Revelation, that we will be reigning with Christ. Number four, we will have a likeness to Christ. We won't be Jesus Christ, but we will have a likeness to him. Sometimes I think we've gotten hung up to the fact that we have to be little Jesuses, you know, reproduce. That is not what the Bible teaches. We will have a likeness. We'll be conformed to his image. Uh, 1 John 3, 1 through 2. And number five. Now, these are the little things, folks. We are going to be above the angels. How many of you realize that? <laughs> I am sure about that. Yes. You want uh, some scripture? Okay. Hebrews chapter 2. Starting with verse 5. And then we're also going to look in Psalm 8, from whence this is quoted. Hebrews chapter 2, starting with verse 5. First of all, he's talking about the earth subject to man. For he did not subject to angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere, saying, What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with 
glory, and honor. In other words, and I have appointed him over the works of your hands, you have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But we do see him, Jesus, who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So let's go to Hebrew, I mean, Psalm chapter 8, from whence this is quoted. You can kind of see the great controversy in a little bit better light when you see some of these verses. Psalm 8. Yes. Uh, no. Starting with verse 4. What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than Elohim, than God. I mean, that's clear what Scripture is saying. So our original creation was to be what? We were to be lower than, just a little lower than God. You know, in other words, we were to be his, in other words, we will be above who? The angels, creation. This was the original plan of the creation. You can kind of see why there's a great controversy going on here. Yes, we were meant that from the very beginning uh, in creation. Now that's the lesser items, folks, that we're going to have as an inheritance. That's the small stuff there. What is the real inheritance that we receive? And what's interesting in chapter 8 of Romans, uh, we take this phrase, heirs of God. Now it can be in a subjective genitive, or it can be an objective genitive, heirs of God. The answer is that in the, uh, in other words, is this a subjective or objective genitive? Again, it could be either. If it is a subjective genitive, then God is the subject, and the meaning is that we belong to God as God's heirs. He has fixed his love upon us and made us his heirs by grace. If it's an objective genitive, then the meaning is that we have God as our inheritance. And that's the real inheritance, folks. That's the big stuff. See, this stuff is the small stuff in the inheritance. That's the small stuff. So, this could be translated either way on that. However, this is taught in Scripture. In Psalm 73, 25 through 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He is my portion. Remember what I said? We have the down payment right now. The Holy Spirit is who? He's God. And where is he? He's in us. See, we already have the down payment. Big uh, thing there that we're talking about. Lamentations 3.24. I say it to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. And then, uh, I thought there was another text. The God of Israel. Okay, and Joshua 13.33. The God of Israel is their inheritance as he promised them. And he's talking about the Levites. Levites got nothing. 
as far as this world was concerned. Nothing at all. And what, did, what were they promised? That God was their inheritance. What greater inheritance can you have than God himself? See, material things are nothing. It's God himself. <laughs> Right. All right. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And things are going to get better. <laughs> That's what our hope is, that they're going to get better. They may get worse for a while, but they're going to get better. That's the whole hope that Paul is trying to bring out here. So our time is up this morning. So next week we're going to start looking at some of the promises because the inheritance is a big theme throughout Scripture. Suffering is a big theme throughout Scripture. And glory is a big theme throughout Scripture. And we're going to be looking at all three of these. So the next time we're going to start looking at Scripture on the promises that we have in the Bible, we're going to look at some of these Scriptures that we have about the inheritance. And then we'll be looking at suffering and through Paul's eyeglasses, how he's looking at this. And he has every right the way he looks at it because he really suffered. You know, there's probably... A uh, few people that have went through all that he went through in his life, you know, uh, in his walk with God. And then we're going to look at this glory, what this glory is, what it's all about. And part of what you're bringing out there is, uh, is to bring glory to God. That's what our whole uh, object and purpose is to bring that glory. Yes, yes. 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 Remember, the more you have, 
the harder you fall. And if you were like a divorce situation is a good way to find that out. The more you have, the harder you're going to fall. And that's true like you're saying about America. We have been so blessed in comparison with other nations that when this stuff starts to be taken away, it's, you know, the people in the third world are already there. See, we're not, see. Eight percent. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, wealth is relative. It really is. It really is relative. Yes, you'd be very poor. But if you were to go to a third world country, you would be considered a millionaire. <laughs> yes. 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 And remember, in North Korea, there's over 38,000 Christians in prison camps. 38,000 folks in prison camps. You know, that just shows you that people are already going through the tribulation, if you want to call it that. They're already going through that. Let's bow our heads as we close. Father, we just thank you for the good news of the gospel and for the hope that you've given to believers that you are there with us through these trials and difficulties that we're going through and that ultimately we have a glorious future to be forever with you, forever in your presence, forever by your side. And we just want to praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.